I'm still Mary Pearl. I'm still an al who's happy, joyous, and free, and I'm very grateful to be here. I want to thank Elise and the committee and everyone that had made it possible for me to be able to come up here this weekend. Uh, she and Joe uh, took me out the other night to dinner, and we went, and I mean, it was, just, it was just fabulous, and your hospitality has been just wonderful, and it's so nice to be among friendly Yankees. <laughs> Um, it's always an honor and a privilege to be invited to share at a conference, uh, the Alcoholics Anonymous. I am very grateful to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. I uh, send you greetings from my husband, uh, J.D., who is at home babysitting my husband and our dogs. And uh, he says, try not to be too hard on them, kitten. <laughs> uh, I have a reputation of being a little hard on alcoholics, you know. Um, as I was sharing with you this morning uh, a little bit about my life, you know, I, I am supposed to explain in a general manner uh, what I used to be like, what happened, and what my life is today. And uh, as I told you, I, I learned a lot from my dad when I went fishing with him. And um, the tragedy to my life was that, I, like I say, I was the change of life baby. I was the youngest of the four children. The closest one to me was my sister, who was 16 and a half years older than me. Uh, so I was raised as an only child. Uh, one brother was dead by the time I was born. The other one uh, was married by the time I was four. And Dorothy was married by the time I was seven. So I was raised as a lonely only child because I went, my mother and father's friends did not have little kids. So I learned how to function with adults. I never learned how to interact well with other children. So therefore, that was going to help to make me extremely self-centered. Uh, my daddy, when we would sit down on that fishing boat and uh, we would talk and we would, I would ask him lots and lots of questions. I was a tremendous why person. And uh, daddy was a very patient man. He would explain to me all the whys, but this had a, a, a downside to it. When I started to school, I had a vocabulary. I had over 500 words that I could read, write, spell, and define. So if you were my first grade teacher, you had hell on wheels coming in your classroom. <laughs> And I was irritated with other kids when they didn't know those things. I was very intolerant, and I tried to help them. <laughs> I had very little patience, and, and so the, my teacher's challenge was to keep me busy so she could teach, you know, because if not, I was teaching the class for her. Um, my sister was extremely smart. They put her up two grades in school. And having done so, took her away from her peer group, and so Dorothy was always a social outcast. Therefore, they would not say anything about putting me up in school. And I'm really grateful for that today. I am very grateful. Um, my father, uh, on November the 30th of uh, 1954, I watched him die of a heart attack at home in bed. And my world, as I knew it, ended right there. I had gone to church with my family on a regular basis. We were that uh, going to church on Sundays and the prayer meeting on Wednesdays and Sunday nights and all. And I was taught about a God that loved me. And I said, well, that's a lie. Because if God loved me, why would he take away my daddy who loved me? My mother didn't love me. I was, you know, I'm a kid that's hard to love. You know, it's really hard to love a kid that does exactly what you tell her not to do. I was a rebel from the front end because I am very self-centered. Even if I want to do it, if you tell me I have to do it, I won't do it. You know, nobody's going to tell me what to do. That was the kind of attitude I had. Now, I was, uh, like I say, I was the straight A-plus student. I'm the overachiever because I have to make an A-plus so I can feel equal to a kid making a C. That's how my self-esteem was. I don't know why it was that way, but that's just how it was. And uh, I was the class valedictorian. I get tickled today that people that I sponsor, they go to soccer games and baseball games and all this kind of stuff. All the sports and activities, I never had anybody there. You know, and so I always think, you know, you're not going to a meeting because of that. My mother never went to any of those things. I survived all that. But I can tell you one thing, I had resentments about that. I didn't like her. Like say, when Daddy died, I declared war, and whoever dies, the other one wins. 
So I made it my personal job to make her life a living hell. I did real well. I know today that I would have killed a kid like me. No question. My mother tried. Uh, she was a physical, a physically abusive mother. She was a verbally abusive mother. Not that my mother cursed at me, but I got things like this. To think to God, I prayed to get pregnant and had you. This is pretty uh, rough stuff when you're 14 years old. Or how about you're the biggest disappointment of my life? Those were things that I took, and Mama said one time, and I said them a million times in my head, you know. And I could always fall back on to poor me, look what happened to me. And I became a victim. I became a victim. And the only thing I lived for was to get away from home. And so God jumped in and said, I'll make an Air Force base in Little Rock. <laughs> and there's an article in the paper that says there's ten men for every woman in the area. And I thought, I want my ten. And I want your ten and your ten. <laughs> you see, if it's worth doing, do it till you die on the spot. There's never too much of a good thing. That was how I lived. Those were my philosophies of life. And so this little Yankee boy, he was from Pennsylvania. He never knew what hit him. And he asked me if I would marry him, and he promised me he would take me away. I would have gone with the devil himself if he'd have said he'd take me away. Because I wanted so badly to get out of that house. I was also in love with the idea of being in love. And I fell in heat all about the same time. <laughs> it all came together for me, you know. <laughs> well, he took me away from home. He took me further than I had ever planned to go. We were stationed in Newfoundland. Oh, that was a wonderful thing, you know. Now, my drug of choice is adrenaline. If I don't have excitement, I create excitement. Well, i got to tell you, Newfoundland back in the early 60s was a very boring place. <laughs> you can just say, oh, moose going through the front yard. <laughs> Annual snowfall average 190 inches a year. So we had snow... Anywhere from eight to nine months of the year. And if there's any, it's just boring. That's just it. You know, you just sit there and watch. You Snow at first is sort of pretty when you haven't seen any. And then after a while, you know, it just gets pretty old. <laughs> I look out in my backyard when I got there in February. And when I got there, I looked out and there were strings stretched across the top of the ground. And I'm thinking, what is that? That's your clotheslines. It was a culture shock, to say the least. But it, more than anything, it was boring. But now, I'm like say, I'm a creator of excitement. And I begin to notice things around me. I'm a, I'm a real watcher of people, places, and things. I like to scope it all out, figure out where I fit in here, fit in the plan. And I realize that I am, for one time, I am in the land of Christmas trees. Now, in Arkansas, if you want a Christmas tree, you have to go down and buy one from the Sertoma or the Optimus Club lot or whatever, you know. We don't have Christmas trees. We have trees with leaves. And uh, in Newfoundland, there wasn't a tree with a leaf. They're all needles. And so I'm sitting there, and I'm thinking, now, I can have the real spirit of Christmas here because I can uh, go up the, the mountain there, and I can cut down a tree, and I can bring it home, and I can make these popcorn and cranberry chains, and I can have the real feeling of Christmas. <laughs> Sounded good to me. I always run stuff past me. And... Um, <laughs> Well, you don't have a descending vote when you do it that way. <laughs> and so I got the help of my landlady's sons who lived in the apartment next to me, and they had a toboggan. I had never seen a toboggan before in my life before coming there. And I had had a sled that I had used twice when I was a child because we don't get a lot of snow in Little Rock area. 
So anyway, the plan was I would take my husband and these two kids, and we would go up this mountain that was right across the street from our house. We had about 18 or 20 steps cut in the ice, and then the road went back and forth. And on the other side was this big mountain with all these wonderful trees. And we were going to go and cut down a tree. We're going to tie it to the toboggan. We're going to bring it back home, and we're going to have our wonderful Christmas. Now, there's the plan. I have never had a plan so good that I cannot modify it in progress. They call me Captain Spontaneity at home. And so what happened? We cut down a tree, and there's something that happens to the trees when you cut them down. They didn't look as good as they did just a moment ago. And this has got to be the perfect tree. So we cut down several trees. And then I realized that the perfect tree is the top of the big tree. So we cut the big top of the big tree, and we have all these trees littering the the surface out there. So we gather them all up, and I'm going to take them back to everybody in the apartment complex who has not asked for a Christmas tree. (laughs) Always willing to help. We tied these trees on the toboggan, and then here's when the plan began to go. I said, why don't we ride back on top of the trees? (laughs) Man, that would be a rush, wouldn't it? So I got on the front, and I had some leftover rope, and I tied me on. And they got on behind me. I always seem to have this group of idiots that will follow directions. I'm a natural-born leader. What can I say? I'm not a follower. I either lead or I don't go, you know. So down the hill we come, and I gained some information real fast, but I can't do a thing with it. And that is, going downhill, you gain lots of speed. There are no brakes on a toboggan. There's no steering mechanism on a toboggan. So I'm coming down that hill, and we're going over some smaller trees. And they get thrown off, but not me. I'm tied on. And all of a sudden, we're coming up on that road, and there's cars going back and forth on that road. I shot between the cars, went right down them ice steps, and through the bottom of my house. (laughs) Thank God they didn't have brick. I'm laying there. I mean, it's created a tremendous hole in the side of the house. And my landlady comes running out, and she says, What are you after doing, you crazy Yankee bitch? (laughs) And I looked up at her, and I said, Don't you call me no Yankee. That's a typical day in my life. (laughs) I worked for the American Red Cross uh, when I was there at the base. And if you've ever been in the military, you know when you're on a foreign soil, you don't get an emergency leave without Red Cross verification. There is, in fact, an emergency. So I liked the power. (laughs) Liked that real well. Uh, I was the kind of person, like I say, I always pushed the envelope. I had a black market on the flight line. I, I bootlegged a whole plane load of watermelons up to Newfoundland. And back in the, like, 62, 63, I was selling them for $10 a piece. I was enterprising. <laughs> it was against the law to carry liquor off of the base, you know. And everybody's going to carry liquor off the base. I mean, let's face it, but they would have these periodic checks at the front gate. I've just been to the package store. I have two big brown grocery sacks full of booze because drinking was a daily thing. It was a way of life. And it was wonderful because, you see, my mother told me, don't ever drink. We have the bad seed. (laughs) So I can't wait to drink. My mother said that because her father died in the the mental institution with wet brain from alcoholism. Her mother died of cirrhosis of the liver from alcoholism. Her oldest brother was shot in bed with another man's wife. He was drunk at the time, but he was my favorite. (laughs) (laughs) Love Uncle A.B., And then she had a brother and sister that was still practicing. My mother was the only person in her family that didn't drink. I always felt like she needed one. (laughs) She was real uptight. That's that untreated Al-Anonism, you know. Anyway, I would stop at that front gate, and so here I am, and the guy pulls me over, and he says, booze check. I said, okay, just a minute. And I got my grocery sacks. I stood out, and I said, check the car. And he checked the car. I said, thank you very much. I got back in, set my booze back in, drove off the base. This is military, for God's sakes. They're not metal giants out there, you know. (laughs) 
My husband was an aircraft mechanic. We were there for five years, and it was time to rotate. And they said, I was talking to the guy down in the psych assignment section. I never talked too much to my husband about stuff. I just did it. And um, he said, y'all are going to go to Minot, North Dakota. I said, Minot? I'm not. I said, I've been up here five years, and I said, no, I am not going to mine out in North Dakota. No, thank you. He said, where do y'all want to go? And I said, well, we want to go back to Little Rock Air Force Base. Don't you know it's going to be all different back there now? You see, I didn't know that everywhere I went there I'd be. Didn't have a clue. And so he says, well, there's not an opening in your husband's career field. I said, create one. See, I've always been a positive thinker. <laughs> and he says, there's not an opening in his career field. I said, well, make one. And he said, I can't. Well, I said, well, then change his career field. He said, well, I can do that. <laughs> so with a stroke of, my pen, of a pen, my husband, who was an aircraft mechanic, overnight became the head of a missile inspection team. <laughs> he had never seen a missile. <laughs> that ought to make you sleep well tonight. <laughs> and we went back to Little Rock Air Force Base. You know how you're going to try it one more time and everything's going to be different? Well, it's not. It's worse. You know, it's just worse. You just, you know, there's some things that's when they're dead, they're dead. You know, quit trying to revive the dead. Go on, go on. And so uh, after they got the paperwork all straightened out, they were going to send him on some, and I decided I wasn't going. And what I did, I told him, I said, you know, We've been in Newfoundland all this time, and I've missed being a hippie. I said, the hippie thing's going on, and I don't want to miss anything in life, and I need to find myself. <laughs> that wasn't a lie. <laughs> but it would, you know, like getting a whole group of Mary Pearls together to find ourselves. But anyway, he said, okay, you see, he came from a broken home, and he didn't want a divorce more than anything in the world. He did not want that. And so I played upon that, and so I decided I wanted to be separated. Now, you can say to yourself, well, why didn't you just go ahead and get a divorce? Well, I wasn't ready to be self-supporting through my own contributions. <laughs> I liked having that allotment check coming in every month, and I didn't have to work, and I could de dedicate myself to being the artist that I was. And, uh, but you know, I got, I got bored during that period of time. And that's when it's always been for me. I look outside myself for something to fix what's on, wrong on the inside. That's the reason it never works. You know, if it's broke inside, it's got to be fixed from the inside. But who knew? And I notice now that there's a gentleman across the street, him, this little girl, and he's one of them. I know he's one of them because, see, he's like my mama's family. They'd go out, get drunk. They'd come home, try to kill one another, burn the house down, you know, just normal alcoholics living together. And um, this guy would go out, get drunk, come home, and beat his little wife up. And she was pregnant. And so that would irritate me. And so Joanne would come over to the house that night, and she said uh, she, she looked pretty bad. He had busted her lip, and her eye was turning blue, and she was in labor. And he, she said, uh, would I take her to the hospital? So we went back over to her house to pack her stuff, and there he was laying, passed out, with a smirk on his face. And I looked at him, and I thought, you know, somebody ought to whip your butt. And then it occurred to me, I'm somebody. <laughs> it's a spiritual awakening. <laughs> I tied him up in his bed sheet, took the slat out of the bed, and I beat the fool out of him. <laughs> and it made me feel good all over. Next morning, he came over at the house, and he said, where's Joanne? I said, she's in the hospital. She had a baby last night. He said, well, I was in this hell of a fight. <laughs> I guess you were. <laughs> and then there was one that lived on the other side of me, too. Did you ever feel like you were a carrier? Because everywhere you go, there they are, you know. This was an old man named Freeman, and the doctor told him he was an alcoholic. If he didn't quit drinking, he'd die. He quit drinking, died anyway. <laughs> he never found Alcoholics Anonymous, you know. We got to see what irritable, restless, and discontent was next door, as if it wasn't in my house, you know. And uh, uh, I, I'm a night person by nature, and so I would come home around 7 in the morning, and I would be ready to go to sleep. Well, this guy had a garden, and he felt like it was best to get out in the wee hours of the morning, like 8 o'clock, until the garden, very unreasonable. And so I went out and I tried to explain that to him, and he told me to shut my mouth and get my fat butt back in the house. You see, he didn't know about Mama and the fish. 
So I got my daddy's frog gigging headlight, and I mowed the grass at 11.30 at night. Well, the sheriff came to see me. Have you ever noticed how narrow-minded law enforcement people are? <laughs> he told me I couldn't do that, and so I said, okay. So now I feel like every good uh, Al-Anon in waiting has contingency plans. So I went into plan B. Now, plan B is Freeman has six beagle dogs. Now, if you've ever had a beagle, you know they're barking little dogs, little hunting dogs. And so he had a whole chorus out there in the backyard. And so what I'd do is I'd wait till the wee hours of the morning. I'd run out of my back porch. I'd take a broom handle, run up and down that dog yard fence. I'd stir them into a frenzy, go jump back on my porch and wait. And he'd come out in his underwear, cuss them out, hose them down, have a fit out there in the yard. He'd finally go back in the house and everything get quiet for about an hour or so, and we'd do it one more time. <laughs> the sheriff came to see me. There were several other skirmishes, and I finally determined that, you know, I'd better look for entertainment elsewhere because the sheriff and I are beginning to develop a relationship. <laughs> We have a neighborhood softball team. Hot damn, I love it. And so I was an athlete in school, and so I got me some stretch boots, some hot pants, and joined the team. I loved it. It was a mixed team, and we just had a lot of fun. And after the, the game, we would go back to someone's house, and we would discuss our strategy for our next game, what we could have, should have done better. And in the doing of that, some of us would pop a few tops, and some of them were <laughs> sniffing some stuff. And some of them had some of those little funny cigarettes, and then that little sugar cube bunch, you know. I mean, it was just your normal gang back in the 60s, your normal neighborhood. And then one night, there's all over at my house, and this little kid got drunk at my house. He was 18. That's not legal age in Arkansas to drink. And so I'm thinking, if he gets picked up by the cops going home and tells him where he got served, then I'm going to have a problem here. So to save myself, I said to him, I'll drive you home, and somebody will follow and bring me back. And got in his little pickup, and he had this little china tea set sitting in the front seat. And I said, what's that? And he said, that's for my mom for Mother's Day. I said, oh, sweet. So it's the wee hours of the morning. It's 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, and I am uh, taking a drunken 18-year-old kid home, you know, and I'm carrying a china tea set, your everyday situation. <laughs> We're going through the house, and he flips the light on in his bedroom. There's a man laying on the bed with nothing but his jockey shorts on. He looks up and goes, well, hot damn, little brother, you brought us abroad home. <laughs> and I said, not tonight, fella. But that's who I'm married to. <laughs> you met yours on the front row of the choir? <laughs> I think not. <laughs> Later on that summer, uh, we met again, and we started dating, and it was just really, really nice. Uh, we just had, seemed to have a lot of things in common, enjoyed doing things together, and the great romance was on. And for the next four years, we had a wonderful time, and then he ruins it. He ruins it. He asked me to marry him. You see, there's a time to tell things, and when you pass the right time to tell, there doesn't seem to be the proper time to tell things, you know? And I said, I can't marry you. And he said, don't you love me? I said, nothing to do with it. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, I'm still married. He said, you're married? And I said, yes. He said, married? I said, I forgot. I forgot. <laughs> you know, out of sight, out of mind, you know. You know, we see what we want to see, hear what we want to hear. You know, that's what we do when you're a self-centered person. It's all about you. You know, you're not much, but you're all you think about. And... <laughs> So I filed for divorce, and guess what? Alcoholism moved into my house. Didn't have a clue. You see, he didn't drink like my mother's family drank. He didn't do the things they did. And you know how you have an idea in your mind of what an alcoholic is. And so it was my grandfather who was the under-the-bridge wino. That was what an alcoholic was to me. And J.D. wasn't there. Uh, it was a, a really... Uh, <laughs> it was it's sort of funny when I think about it. Now, we got married on the 7th of November that year. And for Thanksgiving, we had a bunch of people over. And what did you always do when somebody came to the door to visit? What would you care to drink? I go into my fully stocked bar on November 7th, and it is empty. <laughs> empty. We've been robbed. 
He goes in there and helps me look for it. <laughs> now, the insanity is already gone now, full bloom, because you see, logic, and see, I'm the queen of logic. Logically, if your house hasn't been broken into and there's only you and him and a German shepherd and a poodle living there and you've had an occasional drink, what happened to that alcohol? But you don't follow it there because if you follow it in a logical thing, it's going to point where you don't want to see. And so that's going to begin the process of I'm not going to see stuff I don't want to see. I'm not going to hear things I don't want to hear. Later on, J.D. began to do the disappearing act. You know, he would say he was going out for a cup of coffee and be gone for four, five, six days. And then when he would come back, I'd look at him, and he would act like he'd only been gone ten minutes. And I'd say, how is Juan Valdez? And he'd say, what? I said, well, surely you went to Columbia for the coffee. It took long enough. You know, the sarcasm, the, the, you know, the, the thing about it is there's great power of the human tongue. And with that tongue, I stripped and ripped a man of his well-being. I took his self-esteem away. I kept ripping and tearing at him with the sarcasm and the things that I said to him, and I broke his spirit. There's nothing to be proud of. But as the violence happened with the girl and her husband, the violence would come to our house. And J.D. became my little boy, and I told my little boy what he could do, when he could do it, how he could do it, and where he could do it, and how long he could do it. And when he would go out and get drunk and come home, he had to pay the penalty. He had disobeyed, and so violence entered our home. And uh, it was around Christmas time one year, and like I say, I was doing all my sculptures and things, and I had a whole bunch of greenware sitting on a shelf in my um uh, studio room, and J.D. came in drunk, and he walked like Rick Rack, you know, and I said, don't come in here, you'll break something. Well, see, he's just like me and Mama. If you said don't do it, he's got to do it. It's my house, my God, I'll do what I want to do, you know. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> and he came in there, and I said, don't break anything, and with that, he took his arm, and he pulled that shelf down and broke thousands of dollars of work that I had done that was on order, and something went all over me. And it was the rage like you could not believe. And I grabbed him up and I beat on him and I knocked him out. And I drug him and put him in the closet and shut the door. I didn't even want to look at him. Now, J.D. has a fear of being buried alive. So when he comes to and there's clothing, uh, it's material brushing his face. He thinks he's in the coffin. And he is screaming his head off. I'm alive! I'm alive! <laughs> he shouldn't have told me that. I opened that closet door and I had to do a little tamp dance on him to prove to him that he was, yes, alive, not in a coffin. You know, that's expensive dental work, too, when you're getting that stuff fixed. And so that was our happy little home, you know. Now, by this time, I've had to take a job, and I'm working. I am the assistant to the CEO of a large company there. And I've got to function and do things and try and hide now the fact that I live with someone who's doing the things he's doing. And uh, it became, you know, you begin to have to keep the secrets. And I began to withdraw. I couldn't go to the professional associations and meetings and things anymore uh, because I had to go home and watch. I had to go home and watch. There was the period of time that I went with him to keep him from drinking. That didn't work. Then there was the times that I would go doing, you know, he would, we would play hide and seek. He'd hide, I'd seek. You know, and when I'd find him, it wasn't good. And then uh, I'd go in and tear up a bar and him and his lower companion and the whole schmear. And uh, the bouncer would throw me out. And then I'd get irritated with that and have to go a round or two with the bouncer. And then I'm going to jail for assault. It's not a good time, you know. So then you quit doing that, and then you wait for him to come home so you can kill him. And I would pray, God, please don't let him get killed. I want to do it. <laughs> Pushing him in, taking him back out. Putting him out, taking him back in, that kind of thing. And then finally it got to the point where I said, I can't stand it any longer. I didn't like how I kept feeling, and I was just absolutely a screaming nut all the time on the inside. The people at the office were afraid of me. My boss said, you know, you can get more work out of people than anybody I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah, you're terrified. You don't know what she's going to do. You know, just a little spaz here. And uh, 
So anyway, J.D., I told him, you're going to have to leave, and that's it. And he said, well, I don't mean to do what I'm doing. I think I'm sick. I said, boy, that is the truth. You are sick, sick, sick. (laughs) But I'll fix that. (laughs) So I took him to our family doctor. And for the first time now, the doctor knows what's been wrong with me. I've been in there with nerves, stomach problems, high blood pressure, all these things. And now the doctor finally knows because J.D. says I have a slight drinking problem. That's like saying the Titanic had a bad day, (laughs) you know. And so the doctor told him, you should go to Alcoholics Anonymous. They seem to know more how to deal with this than the medical profession, because, frankly, I don't know what to do for you. And J.D. said, well, I have some friends that are taking a drug called Antabuse. And I just know if I have this little pill that I'll be okay. (laughs) Now, what I heard the doctor say was, if you give him this pill every day, he cannot drink. That is not what the doctor said, but that's what I wanted to hear, so I became the administrator of the pill. You see, by this time, I have the high blood pressure. I've got a dog with epilepsy, and J.D.'s on the pill. (laughs) Every morning in a hurry getting going to work, I don't know who got what, but everybody got a pill. (laughs) Now, for all these years, I have said, if he'll quit drinking, I'll be okay. Well, he wasn't drinking. I wasn't okay. So now you have to reevaluate. And then I realized it wasn't the drinking. It was him. It was just him. He had to go. Well, this was the summer. Now, keep in mind, this is a year of a dry drunk, you know. No treatment for alcoholism. No treatment for my family disease of alcoholism. We're two spas living together. And irritable, restless, and discontent is a nice way of putting how it was in our house. You know, it was things like, what would you like for supper? Anything. Well, would you like fried chicken? No, I don't want fried chicken. What do you want? Anything. Do you want spaghetti? No, you make the world's worst spaghetti. Well, thank you for sharing. (laughs) What do you want? Anything. So I would fix anything, and then he'd say, you don't expect me to eat that, do you? And I'd say, well, you have a choice. You can eat it or you can wear it. (laughs) Sometimes he ate it. Sometimes he wore it. It was that summer I'm sitting there and I'm so miserable and I'm thinking, you know, and that's the phrase that when people I sponsor say, I've been thinking, that just gives me cold chills. <laughs> and what I was thinking was like this, God, I am so miserable. Boy, isn't that the truth. Well, what can we do? I don't know. What do you want to do? Well, you know, you could divorce him. No, you can't divorce Why can't I divorce him? Well, you've already divorced one, and if you have to keep divorcing them, what's the common denominator? We're not going there. But if you know, if he were to die, you could be a... What was that? (laughs) Well, if he were to die, you could be a widow. That's honorable. That's better than divorcee. Oh, yeah, but he's not dying. We can take care of that. (laughs) Well, what do you want to do? Well, personally, I want to take him, take an ice pick, stab him in the neck and watch him drip. Oh, God, that is good. Or we could back over him with the car, make a note, buy new tires. I began to feel better. There was a light at the end of the tunnel. Now, you know, the thing about it is you have thoughts that are crazy, you know, and you run them past the sponsor. You have somebody you can talk to. You don't tell anybody these kind of thoughts if you're not just out there. You know, if I could have heard somebody else say those things, I would have said, they're crazy. But when you're doing it and you're co-signing it yourself, you just justify in rational way murder as simple as anything in the world. Not a big deal. No, nothing difficult about it. And then there was a lady in town that killed her husband, said he was a drunk, and they put her in prison. Tacky, tacky, tacky. (laughs) If I'd have been on that jury, that wouldn't have happened. I can guarantee you that. That would never have happened there. So now we got to have another meeting. So we gather all back and fall, and we're sitting there thinking about it, and all of a sudden it occurred, you know, if an alcoholic were to pass out in the bathtub and drown, who would know? We all liked it. It was a group conscience. <laughs> so now all you have to do is just wait for the time for it to take place. You know, you'd be surprised how patient I could be to get revenge or what have you when the need be. And so later on, a year to the week, he went on interviews. Guess who came home drunk? 
We had ice and snow, and all of a sudden I heard our truck coming down the, the street. You know the sound of your truck. If you've ever, you know, lived in alcoholism, you know the sound of the vehicle. You can hear it from three blocks away. I can smell a cap of a, off of a beer bottle at the back of the room. You know, I mean, you get really attuned to things, you know. Your senses are heightened. <laughs> and I heard our car, or our truck, and it sounded like he was doing about 60 in second. And they, <laughs> say on, you know. And so all of a sudden, he just didn't quite make the driveway. He just came right across the yard. He hit the hitching post horse. It was cast iron in concrete. Went sliding sideways, hit a tree, and then bounced in the side of the house. And I said, he really can't drive on ice and snow. (laughs) And I'm standing there. I'm looking out that window. And I saw him open that truck door and pour out. I'd seen that a million times. I said, that SOB's drunk, and I'll kill him if it's the last thing I ever do. So when he came through the door, I didn't say a word. Just hit him as hard as I could. <laughs> and I don't hit like a woman. You know, I was raised on that highway, and uh, for friends, I had 11 boys and another girl. So I learned to fight the hard way. And so um, and he fell. He hit the coffee table and knocked him out. And I drug him across the living room, down the hall, and into the bathroom. I ran the bathtub full of water. Took his clothes off, put him in, and held him under until the bubbles quit coming. I wanted him dead. He was my problem. And then a voice came that was not a committee member. And the voice said, look what you're doing. You can't do this. I picked him up by the hair of the head, and I said, the hell I can't. Put him right back down again. The voice came back and says, do you not realize this is murder? You're taking the life of someone you once loved. And it's that moment of clarity when you see yourself as you truly are. I had become an animal to fight an illness. Scared me to death. I jerked him out of that bathtub. Thank God I had worked for the Red Cross. I was able to resuscitate him. See, God always goes ahead and plans in love. He knew I was going to need that. (laughs) And... uh, Took him into the bedroom, dried him off, put him in bed, got the hair dryer down, dried his hair. Didn't want him to catch a cold on me now. (laughs) And I shut the door on that room, and I went in my living room, and I started rocking. And I rocked for about eight or ten hours with a desperation I had never known in my life. Because, you see, I I knew I was capable of taking another person's life. I knew I couldn't live like that anymore, but I didn't know how not to live like that anymore and jd nearly died in that room you see he screamed and begged for help out of that room i can't, i didn't go back in there for three days i was afraid of what i would do because i kept vacillating between wanting to kill him not wanting to kill him wanting to kill him not so i just stayed away and i went on to work and people said well, how could you do that i said well i got two best friends justification and rationalization if he hadn't come home drunk i wouldn't have to do that. that's not my fault he made me do that for god's sake You know, that's where you give yourself a good excuse for bad behavior, where you don't take responsibility for your actions. That's what that's all about. And so I came home from work one day, and he was sitting at our bar. He looked real bad. And uh, he was shaking, and he said, I've tried to call Alcoholics Anonymous all day, that number, and I keep getting the wrong number because he was shaking so hard on that push-button phone, he just couldn't get it. And he said, would you call? And I looked at him, and I said, what can a group of drunks do for you that I haven't done? And he said, I don't know, but I know I'm going to die if I don't get some help. (laughs) So I called, and I talked to the lady at the central office, and she told me there was a meeting in one hour's time, six blocks away from our home, in a community building that was built by my grandfather who died of wet brain from alcoholism. And that's where the AA group was meeting. And so I took him over there, and there were two ladies that came up to me, and they said, we have Alan on, and it's for you. And I said, I'm here with him. And there, thank God for the old-fashioned AA. There was an old man there that was in his 70s, and when he came in, uh, he looked over at J.D. and he said, Boy, I'm going to be your sponsor. <laughs> he didn't wait around and wait around to try to find somebody to help him. They came to you, and if that, that old man saved J.D.'s life, saved his life. Uh, later on... Uh, like I say, the worst thing can happen is somebody getting better at your house and it ain't you. <laughs> I'm trying to fight with him, you know, and I'm trying to talk to him, which means tell him how, what I want and make him convinced that's what he wants to do. And uh, he looked at me and he said, honey, you got to easy, does it? 
I said, what? Easy does it, hell, I'll kill something. What are you talking about? He said, honey, you got to learn to live and let live. And I thought, <laughs> save me. And you know, J.D. had done a real sneaky thing. He prayed and asked God to help him stay sober. And first thing God did was relieve him of his job because he could drink on the job. And he changed his playgrounds and his playmates, and that's what brought me to my knees because, you see, now everything financially and everything is on me. And it was more, and I, so I went to the al and I said, how do you manage when there's nothing left to manage, and how do you keep an alcoholic sober? And they said, we don't know the answers to those things. And I thought, why am I here? But there were two, there, the group was two, and two other ladies from another group were visiting that night. See, God knew they were going to need reinforcements. <laughs> and they began to share their stories, which is the best thing we can ever do, share our spirit, strength, and hope with one another. And so I started going to Al-Anon. For a long time, I wondered, why did I keep going back? Why did I keep going back? Today, I know it was the unconditional love that kept drawing me back. I had not felt loved, been loved in a long, long time. And here was people who loved me just like I was, didn't ask me to be any different, just to keep coming back, you know. What a great gift we have to give. Also, they understood. No one told me it was bad to love an alcoholic. Nobody told me it was wrong to do the thing. They just said, you just keep coming back. And as I kept coming back and I got that sponsor and I got into the big book and I got into the steps, my life changed. Anytime you're doing this deal the way you, that it's supposed to be done, your life is going to change. And you don't even know your not, life needs changing until it begins to change, you know. And change is scary. Even when it's good, it's scary. But you never have to do it alone. That's been one of the greatest blessings to me all of these years I've been in. And I've been in since January the 15th of 1977. And my life has changed. I'm not the person that I was when I came in. I have the same defects that could, if if not worked on, bring me right back there, you know, that kind of deal. But I know that there's a power greater than me that made my life different. Now, the worst relationship I had was not with J.D., believe it or not. It was with Mama, that Mama that I'd hated all my life. You know, that was one of the best things in Alna, and I could say, I hate my mother, and the room didn't go, <gasps> you know. And in fact, most of them said, oh, God, yeah, God, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it wasn't socially acceptable out in the world to say you hate your mother. That means you're a rotten kid, you know. Well, I knew that, but I still hated her. And uh, they told me to act as if. And your speaker tonight, his wife, in sharing her story with me one time, gave me some great tools. She told me to learn how to act like a loving daughter. And I don't know how to be a loving daughter. Well, you act as if until it becomes. I was given a tool from a girl in Missouri that said, Ask God to let you see your mother like he sees her. He, you, it's going to look different, trust me. And then I had to accept the fact that my mother wasn't the person that I wanted to have as a mother. And I had created in my mind this set of how I wanted her to be. She wasn't ever going to be that way. Because sooner or later, people, you got to give up all hope of a better childhood. It's a done deal, you know. You can't go back and change the past. You can learn from it and change the future, but you can't change the past. And I had to accept the fact that my mother was not the, the June Cleaver that, I, that you wanted to have as a mother. That wasn't going to be her. Her life experience didn't take her there. And you have to realize that, that most times you, there's no perfect parents, but there's no perfect kids either. You know, and chances are you didn't turn out like they wanted either, <laughs> you know. And so I began to try and accept those things, and dreams die hard. The dream of how I wanted my mama to be, I had to let go of that dream because it was never going to be. And all I did was torture myself every time I went over there wanting her to be different. And I kept praying that prayer, and I kept doing the things I was told to do, like give her that uh, sweet Mother's Day card instead of the Happy Mother's Day bitch card that you want. <laughs> you know, to give her what she wants, to do the things that a loving daughter would do, to try and to heal this. And I had gone to my mama many times trying to make an amends. It never went right. 
and I'd get in, get upset, my feelings hurt, I'd go home crushed, you know, this kind of thing. And so finally, after about five years of taking the right action, I went over to my mother's one fall. I drove in the driveway. We had a real long drive, and she was out in the backfield. She was raking leaves, and I noticed something about Mama. She's short. Now, why wouldn't you know your mother's short? I mean, she came up to hear on me. Why would you not notice that? Because every time you come, you come as a child. And when you're a child, Mama's big. And what do you come for? You want mama to give you something. When have you ever come to give something to your mama? When did you come to bring something here? You know, folks, life is a potluck. What are you bringing? You know, anything you want, you got to be willing to do that deal. You got to be willing to give it out. And the, the law, the spiritual law is if you give it out, it will come back. Maybe not from where you give it, but it will come back. And so as I'm looking at her, as I walked out toward her, God let me see inside my mother's heart. It was not a heart that was full of love that she refused to give me to punish me. That's what I always thought. She withheld love to punish me. She didn't have it. There was a heart with lots of scars on it, not a heart that was overfilled with love. And I realized, you know, my mother came from that alcoholic home where her daddy brutalized her physically, emotionally, and sexually. She ran away from home when she was between 12 and 13 years of age because he was trying to rape her one night and she hit him in the head with a stick of stove wood and she walked hundreds of miles and slept in culverts, stole food out of people's gardens till she got to Memphis, Tennessee. And when she got there, she was in the alleyway next to a boarding house living in a box. Now, that may be fashionable today for homeless people, but in the early 1900s, that was pretty odd. And the lady who owned the boarding house was pregnant, and she came out and told Mama she'd give her room and board if she'd come in and help her because her being pregnant, she needed more help. And my daddy was the head of the recruiting office for the Army in Memphis, Tennessee. He was quite a bit older than my mom. And they, he took his meals in that boarding house, and that's where they met. And when she became 16, they got married in the parlor of that boarding house. You know? She didn't have all that stuff on the inside of her. And then there came that day that I was able to go to my mother, and she was wanting to talk to me about things that happened when Daddy died, and I thought, oh, God, here we go, because she's going to see it one way, and I'm going to see it another. And instead, she just said, why were you such an ornery kid after your Daddy died? And I said, I was getting even with you for not loving me. And she said, not loving you? I gave you a roof over your head. Clothes to wear and food to eat. It was more than I ever had. And you see, it was. You see, I took for granted what to her would have been a luxury. You know, just because you have kids doesn't mean that everybody takes care of those kids. And that was not my mom's experience. She gave the best. She gave everything she would have loved to have as a kid. And I threw it in her face a lifetime saying, not enough, not enough. Well, I want you to know it became enough that day. And I said, Mama, what can I do to make it up to you after all these years of all the things that I've done that have hurt you many times on purpose? How can I make that up to you today? She said, forgive me for not being the kind of mama you needed. And I said, Mama, I forgive you. And my mama got up and she walked across the room. And for the first time in her life, she gave me a hug. And she said, baby, I love you. I've always loved you. And that hole inside of me went away. And it wouldn't have happened if I hadn't followed the directions from the people in Alcoholics Anonymous and Al-Anon that had shared with me, many times not even knowing it, when I hear the tapes, when I go to the conferences, when I listen in the meetings. And the thing about it is you'll hear lots of good things this weekend, but I can guarantee you not one of them will benefit you one iota if you don't take it and make it a part of your life. You gotta take what you hear in these places and make it part of your life. And then once you do that, it works for you too. You know. My sister was my mother. I realized that later on, that that person who had nurtured me and loved me forever like I wanted mama to do, had been my older sister. And I had never noticed it. I took it for granted because it didn't come from where I was looking. You see, that's the thing. Whatever you need is going to be presented to you, 
And so many times you miss it because you're wanting it from over here. You don't even realize you're getting it from over here. And so I was able to thank that sister of mine for being my mama all those years and being the kind of mama I always wanted. You see, she had no children, and so I was her kid to her. And that's what she told me. In 1995, my sister had uh, have open-heart surgery, and um, she became an insulin-dependent diabetic after that surgery. Her blood sugar, she was a type 2 diabetic up until that point with on medication, but after that it was on the insulin. And in the, uh, November the 30th of 1999, 25 years to the day I watched my daddy die, my sister died in her car with me. Um, her kidneys failed, and it threw her heart in a bad rhythm, and it stopped. And I was in bumper-to-bumper traffic in front of the biggest mall in the state. And it's like, I'm driving. God, do I do CPR? What do I do? Do I dr- try? You know, I mean, it's sort of a mixed bag there, you know. And so all of a sudden I saw a motorcycle cop coming, and I got his attention. And I told him, I said, I think she's had a heart attack, because that's what it looked like when her eyes rolled back and everything. And so uh, there was a new hospital just open two weeks, seven blocks away. And so we rushed her over there, and after a while, they were able to resuscitate her and bring her back since it was her heart had stopped as opposed to a heart attack. But Dorothy had been down too long, and she was down 10 to 12 minutes. And she was in a coma for 25 days, and she came out, and it wasn't Dorothy anymore. Her memory for the last 25 years is gone, and her short-term memory is about five minutes, you know. And uh, that was really hard. You know, you you expect people to die, but you don't expect people to be there and not be there. You know, that kind of a deal. You see, I had watched my mother have stroke after stroke in a nursing home and uh, pass away, but nothing quite like this. And remember, my relationship with my sister has always been good. And then all of a sudden, it wasn't Dorothy anymore. In fact, it was like sort of being in Mama Hell Part 2. You know, she became real combative, and her personality changed, and we got her to learn how to walk and to talk and to be continent and all those things, and she wanted to go home. So up until this past December the 27th, for five years, I kept Dorothy in her home with the help of a caregiver and her IRA. Did you know you can go through a half a million dollars in five years with that kind of care? And it became necessary... uh, back in uh, December to put my sister in a nursing home. And that was probably one of the most difficult things I've ever had to do, to sell her home that she's had since 1950 and all of her treasures, because you can't take them with you. We found out the first part of December that J.D. was diabetic. <laughs> so we've, we've, we've had a few little challenges already this year. Um, Dorothy um, is sort of content of being in the nursing home. She's accepted the fact she has to be in the nursing home, but she's become uh, very uh, threatening to her roommate. And so now they're threatening her with a psychiatric hospital. So, you know, it's one of those things. Like I kept thinking, you know how you think, well, when we get her situated, everything's going to be okay. And, well, when we get the house sold, then everything's going to be okay. And then when we get this, and you know something? I don't know if things are ever going to be okay, but you got to do them just one day at a time. That's what I've learned. You can't wait for everything to be okay because you got to live in the right now. And if Dorothy's taught me anything, it's how to live in the now, you know, because her now is all she's got, you know, that kind of thing. And she tells me things, though, that's sort of funny. She says, um, would you promise if I die in the car with you again that you won't have me revived? I said, honey, if you die in the car with me again, I'll drive you around six or eight hours. You're stiff as a damn poker. (laughs) No problem. No problem. If I hadn't had a sense of humor, I I wouldn't have been able to deal with this. Also, the fact is, if I hadn't had my group and people all over the world praying for me, I am a firm believer in the power of prayer. God works the miracles, you know. And when we pray, we just make the power greater to me. That's what it amounts to. And people have walked with me every step of the way. I've never had to do it alone. There have been times when I have felt like I would just keep saying, I trust you, God. I trust you, God. I don't really right now. I trust you, God. I trust you, God. Because it's like, you know, you can't see. You, you know, we want to see around the corners. 
And you don't have to worry around seeing around the corners if you're with the guy who sees around the corners. He'll see for you. And there will be enough and there will be everything you need to take care of what you need to take care of in that 24-hour period of time. I do believe that because God does go ahead and plan in love. You know, I had no idea that my sister was in the kind of shape she was. And what happened when Dorothy went down, uh, within two weeks I was in another hospital with something wrong with my heart. And uh, if I had not had Dorothy to take care of, you've got to take care of yourself first before you can help somebody else. And if she hadn't had what she had, I might have been flying somewhere and just crept out and never known that I had something wrong. So we had to take and address that. So everybody's life is changing. J.D. was going along like, ha, ha. Well, now he's diabetic. His life is changing, too. <laughs> but thank God, because having a diabetic sister and having to watch all this stuff, new proper ways to do things to be able to give him the benefit of that if he chooses to take it. And he went to the doctor this past Wednesday, and the doctor says, J.D., you are doing fabulous, doing fabulous. From a man whose blood sugar was over 600 points to having it back to normal in four days, he was doing what he was supposed to be doing, you know, and it's been there ever since. My life is but a weaving between my God and me. I do not choose the colors, but he worketh steadily. Oft times in sorrow, sometimes foolish pride, I forget he sees the top while I the underside. Not till the loom is silent and the shuttle cease to fly will God unroll the canvas and explain the reasons why. But the dark threads are as needful in a skillful weaver's hand as the threads of gold and silver in the pattern God has planned. Thank you.